Well, good morning, everybody here at BCC. Good morning to you as you are coming into the service. And a big welcome to all of you joining us online, whether you are live with us this morning or catch up. We just want you to be part of our service today and to enjoy um, the, what is going to be a fantastic time together. Uh, so, well, a big welcome back to all of you who have been away, perhaps at half term. I know a lot of people travel. And if you're visiting with us for the first time, a big welcome. As we start our service, I've got a question. My question is, where is my trust? Now, that's a good question to have before a church service, isn't it? Where is my trust? Where is it? What do I put my trust in? Because where we put our trust can affect what happens as life goes on, on our journey. And uh, we would know that because I know I'm speaking to a, a congregation and people online who are familiar with uh, Christian thinking. But where we put our trust is seriously important because that can determine all sorts of outcomes. And uh, I've got Psalm 91 this morning, just a couple of verses that I want to reflect on. And this is the encouragement. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long uh, with a long life and give them my salvation. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. So where we put our trust matters. And so as we come to church this morning, as we come to our, our worship time, that's what we've got to wrestle with in our heart. Where is my trust? And we know by and large, we know exactly where it is. But perhaps today you're feeling a bit shaky. Maybe today you're feeling like, oh, can I really trust God? Can I just encourage you to dig deep? Sometimes by faith, we've just got to step forward and say, yep, I'm going to reset my trust in God, in Jesus Christ. I'm going to reset it and I'm going to step forward. So this morning, let's stand. I feel like I just want to pray. We're going to have a, a great couple of services where there's going to be worship, there's going to be the Word of God. There's going to be some features. There's going to be information about who we are as a church. So if you're new, then you'll get to experience a bit of who we are. But really all we are trying to do is in some small way represent God. And that's a big, big ask, isn't it? But to enable people to see Him through what we do. So we're going to pray right now that, that God's light will shine, that we will be strong ambassadors for him. So, Father, we thank you this morning that our trust we know, Lord, is in Jesus Christ. Lord, when we call you answer, Lord, you want to guide our lives. You want to be very involved with us, just like those verses say. Father God, this morning as we come to you in worship now, we thank you, Lord God. We want to lift you high. We want to celebrate the goodness of our God today, Lord, in every aspect of our service. But Lord, as we come to worship now, we want to lift you up, Lord Jesus, because you are the center of our focus in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. I was buried beneath my shade. Till I made you And I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Call my name, and I ran out of that grave. 
my sin was heavy, but chains break out the weight of your glory. I need a shelter, I was an orphan, when you called me a sinner. Let's see when I was broken. When I was broken, you were my healing. Oh, your love is the air that I breathe. Come on. I have a future. My
Reflect on the statement, there is no one like the Lord. And just reflect on what that means. It's true. Lord, there is no one like the Lord. And Lord, as we stand here and we sing our songs, Lord, we know that around the world there are millions and millions of people who are singing similar songs, perhaps in different languages, different cultures. And Lord God, you see every heart, every human heart. And this morning, Father, we just want to say thank you, Lord, that you have drawn us back to know you, that we do understand who Jesus is, that we we know that he is above all, he's been through everything, and yet he knows us intimately. And, and today, Father, we thank you that, that you love us. We thank you, Lord, that we, Lord, we just thank you that we can honor Jesus. We can honor the work of God in, in our lives, in the lives of those around us, in the lives of, Lord, people across the world. We thank you, Father, that your kingdom is advancing, that, Lord, actually, it's the most powerful kingdom that has ever existed in the history of the nations of the world. And I thank you, Lord God, that, that, Lord, we are part of that, Lord, for now and for eternity. So, Father God, we just praise you and we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Do take your seats. Do take your seats. And uh, as we continue in our worship, we move straight into an offering time. Uh, as you would know if you, if you come regularly to the church, and if not, then that's what we do. Uh, but um, everything pretty much is online. There are QR codes on your seats. But our offering time is more of a reflection in our worship that, um, that why we give. And I, at the start of the, the service, I, I sort of asked the question, who do we trust? Uh, well, where is my trust? Uh, and now I'm going to ask the question, who is my source? <laughs> who is my source? Because our source matters as well. And source being not what you put on your chips. It's what, what, where, where the good things come from. And I just want to, you know what, if I said to you, ask them another question, what's the most famous psalm in all the world? Go on, you shout it out. I don't normally like people shouting out in church. So, oh yeah, we're within no time at all, Psalm 23. And I just was thinking about this over the last few days, Psalm 23. So often Psalm 23 is a psalm they use in very austere moments when there's been, you know, a tough time in people's lives. But if you actually look at Psalm 23 and you were to look at the first three verses, which I'm going to do right now to inspire us. This is what David said, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd. I shall not want. And we'll go on to the next two verses, but that first one, I shall not want. In other words, he knew everything comes from God. And at people's toughest times in their lives, they go back to Psalm 23 because it gives them a sense of strength in tough times. The trouble is when we're in the not so tough times, what's our response? So it's good to read it in a not so tough time perhaps. Then look at this verse two. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. In other words, he leads, he guides. He, he takes us to the right locations. And that's why he's got to be our source. And so in offering times, that's what we're reflecting on. Then the verse three, he restores my soul. In fact, we just had those words in the song we just sang. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. These are weighty words, but they're so exciting and inspiring that the Lord is my shepherd. I will not want, I shall not want, I will not lack anything, other translations say. So that's a, a good thing to reflect on as we have already given. And as you are deciding in your heart whether you would like to give or, or could give. But um, I just want to say this is a very, very generous church. You know, we're a tithing church. We're a church committed to kingdom of God values. And so we celebrate the fact that we can give and that God provides to us and ways to give are on screen. I'm going to pray and thank God that he is our source. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God, that you are our shepherd. And Lord, we lack nothing. And Lord, maybe there are times when we feel that things are getting a bit thin financially. But Lord God, help us to remember that Lord, you do provide. And in the right time, you do provide. And in fact, you provide abundantly, we know from Scripture. And we know from our experience that that's true. And Lord, it's not that you just provide finance, but you actually guide us. You guide us to places of rest. You guide us to places of recovery. You guide us, Lord, to places of restoration. And I thank you, Lord God, that it's way more than just a, a number moment. This is a thank you, Lord God, that you have provided everything for us and that we can give back. So Lord God, bless those who are giving and those who are learning how to do that. And I just thank you, Father, that you are going ahead of us in everything. Lord, as a church, guide us, lead us, give us wisdom as we allocate the funds that come into this house for the purpose of the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning to you all. Welcome back to those who've been away. I said that at the start of the service. Uh, if you've been away at half term, some of the, Guata the balance of the Guatemala team are back. So welcome to you guys, whether you're in the room or suffering from jet lag or whatever it is. But a uh, big welcome back. Welcome back, Sophie. Thank you for leading us this morning. And, uh, you know, if you're new, we just want to let you know some layout. There's lose out in the lobby. There's welcome team, connect team. There's a whole kids program running, and we have translation, Spanish and Portuguese normally in all our services. So if you hear the odd rumble from the back of the room, it's not a disconcerted uh, sound person or media person. It's actually a translation that's going on. Anyway, praise God for that. And um, I've just got to say, because half term is now over, parents, you're sighing a sigh of relief now as the kids all head back to school. 
uh, but also the, all the usual programs for the Ark is back up and running, Pebbles is back up and running, everything that is normal during term time is up and running, and also the prayer meeting on Wednesday night will be back on, so that's good news as well. Also, just want to say Alpha, we, are, we have had two weeks of Alpha, the guys are doing a brilliant job of leading that on Friday evening. And it's uh, going really well. I, was, I happened to be on site when it was running on Friday, just briefly. And uh, lovely to see guests coming in from outside the church to be part of Alpha. But there is probably this week is the very, very last week you could join it if you've not joined the Alpha course at all. If you'd like to know more about that, there's information in our lobby. There's an Alpha card. It's, it's a brilliant vehicle for discovering and exploring what faith in in Jesus Christ is rooted in and what it all means from a biblical perspective. It's a great, great international course. So that's Alpha. Uh, also, I just want to say that the Academy, our training, if you like, umbrella for the church, uh, is pleased to announce the next part, second part of the Israel-focused discussions. But this one's called History, the Church and Israel. It's on the 14th of November. And uh, you just need to register online to be part of that. They had a very, very successful first part just recently. This is more getting deeper into the context with the Word of God. So do register for that. Uh, we had baptisms last Sunday, second service. That went brilliantly. We've got a whole load more people who want to get baptized. Our next date is Sunday, 24th of November. So that's after the second service or during the back end of the second service. There's uh, baptism cards in the lobby speak to the team out there also it's communion next week so be ready online those of you who are joining us online regularly in our live morning first service so uh, also uh, that's it so that's good for the notices I've got to say we've got a brilliant guest speaker this morning well I say guest she's really part of the furniture aren't you Deborah <laughs> but uh, she's she lives in God's country down in Wiltshire boom boom same old one uh, but you know Deborah does so much to support people in the church and you know amongst the women's ministry bible study uh, leads the bible study again it was on this week wasn't it Deborah and mentoring some of our ladies in the church so you know when she comes up a big welcome to her but we're just about to watch the feature I promised last week about the Guatemala trip it is longer than our normal feature but I think you guys you were so generous uh, for those who don't know we we just raised funds and sent thousands of pounds or in the process of continuing to send thousands of pounds into projects in um, three needy villages in Guatemala. So the team flew for nearly a day and a half traveling, 11 people to just serve in that community. And we did see some outstanding outcomes. And we just, it's so hard to communicate what was really seen when we were there. But hopefully this this feature will give you an idea of some of what we experience. So let's run that. And then when Deborah comes up, give her a huge welcome. We're here in the community village San Jose El Yalu and we are about to deliver three bets in the community. So our goal was 13, this is number 11, and then we'll be able to do the rest of the two. This is our last day building them and assembling them and praying for the families. So it truly is a privilege for all of us to be here. UK team uh, to be able to bless these families and to, especially as I said before, to show them the love of God and how God thinks about them, how God loves them, and that's why we want to bless them. Aquí estamos ya en la casa de Doña María Hilaria. Muy bien. And so we're here to, uh, to see the house. This is the house where we're going to give the bunk beds to. Uh, this is only a part of the kids that she has. In fact, she has in total 11 of them. And these are just the ones that are staying with her. 
And so if you want, you can follow me. We can see where they live and where the bunk bed would be uh, placed. Okay, let's go. Our mission included assembling 13 bunk beds for families in need, meeting and praying with Aurelio, supervisor of the Hencoop Enterprise, to discuss its progress, painting and refurbishing the school and medical clinic in San Rafael and Random's Children's Ministry headquarters, visiting Casa Bernabe Orphanage to uplift staff, parents and children through friendship and support, assisting Random's Children's Ministry investing in the lives of the next generation. Partnering with 14 doctors from Medical Missions Ministry for three days of medical care and donating equipment. Throughout our journey, we not only achieved these goals, but also witnessed God's transformative love at work in the hearts of those we served. Hi everyone at VCC, we've arrived here in Guatemala and we're going to one of three clinics this morning. We just brought a brand new um, bed, a clinical bed, uh, to bring to this clinic for the community. And we have the person who's responsible for this clinic, or is part of the team anyway. And we've also brought a bunch of other medical pieces of equipment that we had sent over from the UK and yeah. we've also purchased here. So the bed was purchased here, yeah. some other things have been purchased here. Um, stethoscopes, uh, blood pressure meters and all that kind of stuff, plus medicines we're going to provide as yeah. part of the provision. So when, if you were standing here like we are, you'd see how sparse this room is. There's a waiting area outside with a whole bunch of chairs and technically this is closed today. So she's come in specially to yeah. show us uh, or let us in and we can deliver this bed. Yeah. So that's a, a good thing. By assembling 14 bunk beds, 40 to 50 children are now sleeping off the floor for the first time. During our three days of medical missions, we treated and prayed for 388 individuals, many of whom experienced both physical and inner healing. Together with you, who generously gave and prayed into the projects of this mission, and with over 100 volunteers from different ministries and countries, we witnessed the power and love of Christ leaving behind a legacy of miracle healings, decisions to follow Jesus and hope to see transformation within the community over the next decade. Thank you to all of you who were involved, whether it was by giving, praying or serving. You're all taking part in God's plan to transform Guatemala. The beginning of new seasons means we can't stay the same way as individuals and as a people. This is a season of pursuing our capacity.
Good morning, church. Good morning. It's so emotional watching that back, Sophie. And um, <clears throat> I think perhaps uh, one of the most moving parts of the whole trip for me was as we left to go, the children gathered round us to pray for us. And as we stood there, sort of joined in a circle, I could feel all these little hands on me. Because <laughs> some of them were only about this high, but they learned to lay hands on. And so you could feel these little hands touching you everywhere. It was incredible. It was the most incredible trip. And I just want to add my thanks to all of you who fundraised for the projects that we did. And uh, we paid for ourselves to go, but you fundraised for all the projects that we did and you were over and above. And it, if we could just take you all there for 48 hours, just to experience it, you'd all want to go. <laughs> you know, it was incredible to see what God has done and is doing through relationship. Of course, through Sophie's mum and dad who are there all the time. And of course, we piggyback onto that relationship and now building a relationship of our own out there, which is amazing, with the group of Americans and the Guatemalans out there, Raindom and those who are working there. It was truly amazing and can only get better, can only get built on. Um, it was great being with the team because there were people I didn't know. And so spending time with people is always fun. We got on really well. We had a lot of laughs. And... Um, I learned a lot of things about a lot of people, but you know, <laughs> we'll save that for another sermon. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, it was great. I want to share with you this morning in my message part of my own personal testimony of what I've been going through over the last three months because it's really pertinent to what happened out in Guatemala as well. And I really believe that what I want to share with you is going to help some of you in the situation that you're in at the moment, but also where we're at as a church and where God wants to take us. And, and about 35 years ago, just before I left New Zealand to come back home, um, two people prophesied over me. And what, the first person who prophesied over me knew me. And so, although it really gelled with my heart, I knew this person knew me. And so sometimes, and I'm not saying always, of course, but sometimes when someone knows you and they prophesy over you, it could be part of the desire that they have for you as well. And so, of course, it's right that we test when people prophesy over us. But I held on to this word in my heart. And about a couple of weeks later, I was in a conference and I was called out. And the person who I've never seen before, never met before, prophesied over me exactly the same prophetic word. So I knew that this was what God was saying to me. Um, and I was, what, about 33 at the time. And it was the direction for my life. And so I wrote it down and I've continued to see the fulfillment of that word over the years. Some of it was to do with the, prof the, the teaching gift that God was going to give me and how he was going to outwork that. And of course, we've seen that over the years. But there was other things in that prophetic word that are coming to pass and have been coming to pass and will continue to come to pass because God is growing it, growing me. And so I keep this prophetic word very close to my heart. And every time I start a new journal, I copy it into the front of the journal so I don't forget it. And I pray into it because if God has spoken into our lives, it's important that we don't forget what he has said. And I want to encourage you if you don't journal, but God speaks to you, write it down somewhere or on your phone, or wherever you want to do it. But don't forget. Um, and so, two things out of this prophetic word that have guided my life over the last number of years is that, one, God wanted to, wants to teach me how to contend in the spirit. He said that whatever he was going to do with me in my life, and I'm pray seeing that, I need to learn how to fight in the spirit. I used the word contend. Just as in the prophetic word, just as Joshua learned to contend in the land, you need to learn to contend. So I've always had that in my heart. And those of you who know me from last year, my vo I have a verse of scripture every year which guides me. And I, last year I chose um, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. God, how do I really pray those kind of prayers that will avail much? And the second thing that is pertinent from that prophetic word um, was, and I've just forgotten it, it'll come back to me in a minute. Anyway, contending in the spirit. Um, 
Okay, my mind's still thinking about that video. Um, so anyway, this, this year, the verse that I chose for myself, and, and I've, has sort of guided me through the year, is from Jeremiah 33. Thus saith the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the Lord who transformed, the Lord who formed it to be established, the Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer you and will tell you great things and hidden things that you do not know. So all of this year, and I've used this verse before, I've been expecting God to show me hidden things that I did not know. And that's the good thing about having a verse of the year, if you like, that God, this year, I want you, show me, show me hidden things, show me great things. So why should I be surprised if God shows me great and hidden things that I did not know? And I'm telling you this because it's pertinent to what happened to me in Guatemala. And so I regularly pray these things. Oh yes, I've written it down here. The other thing that God said in this prophetic word was that he would take me into a new realm and dimension of his spirit. And that certainly connects with learning how to contend in the spirit. And so over the many, many years, I've continually said, God, take me deeper, take me deeper into a new realm and dimension of your spirit, because I know you've said that you will. So this morning, I want to share with you in pursuing our capacity is exercising faith. Because it's so important what we do with our faith. And God has been revealing to me new things that I didn't quite understand or didn't quite know. Or maybe I've read thousands of times, but it's sort of come together over these last sort of 10 weeks. And so I want to talk this morning about how we exercise our faith. So first, first of all, let's just think about what is faith. So faith in Hebrews 11 says that faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Chris Vallotton, who's a pastor in Bethel, he's put it like this. He says, the invisible becomes visible through the force of faith. So faith is a vehicle to bring the visible from the invisible realm. And so hope is also an important part of that, which underpins faith. But we know that we live in the real world, the visible world, that we can see, but we also know that there is an invisible world. We don't fight against flesh and blood, we fight against principalities and powers, which we can't see, but we can see the evidence of. And so it's really important that we understand how do we bring the realm of the visible into the realm of the invisible, and it's faith. It's faith that's the vehicle. So how much faith do we need? And the Bible speaks about that, and God's been showing me new things in that area. And how do we grow our faith? And it's really, I've come to understand more recently, it's not about how much faith we've got. It's about what we do with the faith that we have. And sometimes I think we beat ourselves up because we say, oh, we didn't have enough faith. But the Bible doesn't actually say you don't have enough faith. It's not what you do with, it's not how much faith you think you've got. It's actually what you do with your faith. And as we've heard already this morning, faith must have complete trust and confidence in God. And the things that he, and to see things from his perspective. Because faith is not tangible, exercising faith has to be based in a relationship and it has to have complete and utter confidence in the God that we know and love and serve. But if our experience is that God has failed us and that we're not able to trust and have confidence in him, we will not be able to exercise faith. Faith doesn't operate outside of our relationship with God because it's his vehicle for changing things and moving things. And until we get to a place where we know beyond doubt that he's faithful and he's trustworthy, we've sung this morning, there is no one like our God. Until we get to that place, it, we will find it really hard to exercise faith. We will be in and out, of, we will be double-minded, and the Bible says that that makes us unstable. We have to know what it means to hope in God. So we must all be, also be able to recognise the difference between faith and belief. It's because faith involves trust and confidence and endures in the face of doubt. But belief is something that we take to be true. And so we can hold a belief 
that God exists but have no faith in him. You go up, go up the high street and stop people and say, do you believe there's a God? And they'll, a lot of people will say, oh, yes, I believe there's a God. And you'll say, well, do you go to church and do you have a relationship with God? And they say, no. You can have a belief that something is true and have no faith in him. Faith is about trusting and having, knowing that he is faithful. And so the first thing maybe we need to kind of reflect on is do we have faith or do we have belief? Do we really trust in him and have confidence in him? Um, or do we really walk with him and know him? Do we just believe that he's there? When I came to Christ, my prayer of salvation was, God, I don't even really know if you are there. Because I didn't. But if you are, then show yourself to me. Reveal yourself to me. Because I want to follow you. And so belief and faith are two different things. So where's our starting point in then for all of us, once we come into relationship with God, where is our starting point? And it's this. All I right. say to you, Romans 12, 3, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according to God, uh, sorry, accordingly, as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. God gives yes. every single one of us a measure of faith. You can't say you don't have faith if you are a believer because God has given you a measure of faith. We all have a measure of faith. It's what we do with that measure that determines whether the faith grows or whether we can use faith effectively in our lives to bring the realm of the invisible into the realm of the visible. But every single one of us who has made a commitment to love God, know God and follow God has been given a measure of of faith, and that measure is, is, is from him. And therefore, if he's given us that measure of faith, we should be able to exercise and use that measure of faith. It's a gift from God. So we all start from the same place with a measure of faith. But if we look at the scripture, you'll see that God likes measures. God likes to measure things. Why does God like to measure things? Well, there's many reasons why God likes to measure things. Um, if we look at uh, when the build, they built the temple, when they built the tabernacle, it was very specific in its measurements. God talks about his word as a plumb line, as a measurement for being upright and being straight. And so God likes to measure things. Why does God like to measure things? Well, measurement can reflect the value of a thing. So gold is measured in carrots. Diamonds are measured in carrots. The measurement of those carrots determines the value of the things that they're measuring. And so measuring things can determine its value. Measurement also can show us if there's a growth in something. And that's why I love to journal, because I can look back over my journal and I can see I've grown. I can see I've changed. I can see the things that I wrote a year ago have actually moved me forward in my Christian life. So measurement helps us to know whether we've grown. But measurements also test us to see if we will do something with what God has given us to do. So, for example, in the parable of the talents, God gave three men, one one talent, one two talents, one five talents. But when they came back with it, the one who had five now had ten, the one who had two now had four, the one who had one had done nothing with it. How would God have known if they'd done anything with it if he hadn't measured what he'd given them? And so therefore God likes to measure things. And so he's given us a measure of faith to see what we will do with that measure of faith or whether like the man with the talent, we're just going to give it back to him at the end of our lives and say, well, I didn't, didn't do anything with that measure of faith because actually it was more just a belief than it was a life of faith. And so if God wants to measure things, it's not what we start with, it's what we end up with that's really important and how we grow it. So I want to look at a couple of examples in scripture about um, what Jesus said about having little faith, because I've come to understand that we've misinterpreted what God means by little faith. 
Because so often we say, and I've, so, I've heard it many times, if we had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, and we all go like this, don't we? Because a grain of mustard seed is about that big or even smaller. That's not what God was talking about. So if we think of the story in Matthew 7, 17, I'll put it up in a minute. Jesus, a man came to Jesus and said, look, my son's got epilepsy, but your disciples weren't able to heal him. And so they brought the man to Jesus and Jesus healed him. And then the disciples came to Jesus in private and they said, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. That word little in the Greek is oligos and it means brief. It doesn't mean little grain of mustard seed. It means brief. So what Jesus was saying to these disciples was, you didn't persist long enough. Your faith was too brief. It doesn't take much faith to move a mountain. It takes persistent faith to move a mountain. And sometimes we shrink back because we've taken this word little to mean little instead of meaning brief. And in this particular case, Jesus was saying, actually, this boy would have only been healed by prayer and fasting. So persist even further in your faith, not just to pray a prayer and expect this thing to have resolved, but to actually move on and to come to a place of prayer and fasting and endurance in your faith. Um, it, in Proverbs, it says this, it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. What is hope? What is biblical hope? Hope in biblical terms is the expectation and desire that something will happen. Biblical hope is not like standing at the bus stop, looking at the timetable and saying, I hope a bus comes because this, this is the time. It's not that kind of hope. It might happen. It might not happen. Biblical hope is certain and sure. It's expecting and desiring that something will happen. And so it's not deferring what we hope for that makes the heart sick. It's deferring hope. It's not persisting long enough in our faith that we give up because we don't see the outcome of what we expect. The expectation and desire that something will happen. Hope is a feeling Hope doesn't see, hope is a feeling, faith sees. And therefore hope has to underpin faith. I hope in God, but I see in faith. So faith in Hebrews being the evidence of things not seen, our hope is our desire and our feeling of what we want from God. But faith sees it, faith sees it complete, faith sees it having happened and is the vehicle for bringing us to that place. Because sometimes our hope is based on feeling, when we don't see what we hope for, we so often change our prayers. And I've heard this thousands of times in my Christian life. We change our prayer from certain hope to, oh, well, God, if it's your will. That is just a get out clause as far as I'm concerned. If we don't know what God's will is, we shouldn't be praying it. <laughs> because we pray according to God's will. And then when we don't see things happening, we lose our faith and we say, uh, we, we say, oh, well, if it's your will, God, let this happen. So what's happening here? Well, God showed me this while I was away and, and I'm going to it, um, testify to what God showed me in my own personal life. But what God said here is that this, this is a spirit of foreboding that comes to taunt us. It comes to destroy our faith. A spirit of foreboding is a spirit of kind of doom and gloom. It's kind of come to taunt us, to tell us, well, that wasn't really, that wasn't really God's will. So you can now just appease God by saying, oh, well, if it was your will. And so it causes us to lose faith in what we are believing in. And it persuades us that what we hope for will not happen and so we abandon that prayer. And then somehow we think, well, I must have got it wrong. I must have heard God wrong. I must have got it wrong. 
So how can I relate to this? And I want to give you an example. About 10 weeks ago, I was stung by some wasps that had um, nested in our garden in the grass. And they came up out of the grass and attacked me. And I had some very bad wasp stings. I reacted very badly to them. And I had um, cellulitis, I had to have antibiotics. And unfortunately, they left me with a residual um, trigeminal neuralgia in my face. So it attacked the nerves in the side of my head. And if any of you have ever had that, it is excruciating. Because if you can't get medication from the doctor, you can't buy a medication over the counter, which actually will deal with that kind of nerve pain. And it was incredibly painful. And in that time leading up to going to Guatemala, I hesitated as to whether I should go or not and whether I could cope with it or not. And I was going to the osteopath for treatment. And, and right up until the last minute, I didn't know whether or not I was going to go. And I, at that point, I hadn't told anybody in the team about it either. And so I decided I would go. And as I met them all at the airport, I was in a lot of pain. Uh, whenever I coughed or sneezed or raised my arm or turned my head, I was having a lot of pain in the side of my head. And um, I determined that actually God was trying to teach me something. That this, wasn't some, this was something that God was trying to show me, bearing in mind what I told you, that God is teaching me to contend in the spirit, that God is going to show me great and mighty things I did not know. And so this is not my normal pattern of behavior, but I determined that God was trying to show me something. So I was just going to walk this journey. Anyway, by the time I got there, um, I was absolutely exhausted. And in the first couple of days, as you know, I opted out of a couple of things because I was feeling so bad. But I hadn't said anything to anybody. And I was determined that I was going to find out from God. I was going to shut myself in with God. I didn't want to ask for prayer, not because I didn't want people to pray for me, but I didn't want human reasoning to, to just perhaps take my mind off what I thought God was trying to teach me at this time. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't ask for prayer, of course, but in this situation, I felt God was saying, just shut yourself in with me because I want to speak to you about this. And so for the first few days, I was in a lot of pain. I couldn't lie on this side, but I carried on with the things that we were doing. We were doing medical mission and I loved that. It was fantastic. And um, interestingly, when we were testing the equipment for the medical mission, they checked my blood pressure because we were checking the blood pressure machines. And they said, gosh, your blood pressure's up. And I said, oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> I knew it was up because I was in pain. I knew that. They said, oh, you ought to get that sorted. I said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'll deal with it when I get home. And of course, it's back to normal. So um, anyway, um, about halfway through our time there, I was really getting to the end of myself. I was really, really struggling. And I had a room on my own. And in the middle of the night, I was awake and I was sitting on the side of the bed. And I was in so much pain. I just didn't know what to do. And I sat there and I just cried out to God. And I said, God, I'm around the other side of the world. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with myself. And I'm in so much pain. You have to do something. And God said to me, and then I started to think, maybe I've got this all wrong. Maybe I shouldn't have come. Maybe I've really got a brain tumor. Maybe, you know, this has been going on now for so many weeks and I didn't go to the doctor. Maybe I should have gone to the doctor. And I started thinking all these things and my faith just disappeared. And as I sat on the side of the bed in the pitch black, crying out, God, show me what to do. God said to me, this is a spirit of foreboding. It has destroyed your faith. You're now thinking that you're going to die before you get back home. And it's the spirit of foreboding. And so I sat on the edge of my bed and I said, right, in that case, I'm not having it. <laughs> and I sat there and I just said, spirit of foreboding, you have no authority over me. I'm a child of the living God. You have no right over me. And I command you now, leave me alone and get out. And immediately I felt my faith just rise up again within me. And I thought, I can do this. I can do this. God, we're back on board. We're back on board. Of course, I haven't got a brain tumor. I've just got this nerve pain in my face. And I believe that you're going to heal me. And 
Anyway, I did finally manage to go to sleep. I've never had those thoughts again. I've never had those thoughts again. And uh, I did manage to go back to sleep, but in the morning I felt absolutely shipwrecked. And so I thought to myself, I really have to find someone to pray for me now because I'm struggling to get through the day. And we were really busy. And we had to get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, which, of course, when you're retired, you don't do. <laughs> in fact, you don't even know what day of the week it is when you're retired. <laughs> yeah. um, and as I came out of my room, I had a lot of pain in my head. And as I came out of my room, I noticed Sophie and Andrea, this guy, who was studying in Guatemala City in the School of the Supernatural, the Bethel School of Supernatural. And I saw them sitting on the veranda. And I thought to myself, well, if anybody here has got the gift of healing, it could well be Andrea, because <laughs> he's in the School of the Supernatural. So I walked over to them and I said, look, I haven't told anybody this, but I'm going to tell you because I need someone to pray for me. And so, um, of course, they agreed. And then um, Andrea said, can I put my hands on your head? Well, up until that point, I hadn't been able to tolerate anyone touching my head. And as you can see from my hair, I hadn't had my hair cut because I just couldn't tolerate people touching my head. And I have had it cut now, so um, it's healed. Anyway, when Andrea put his hands on my head, I felt the pain leave me. I felt the pain leave me. And as I, um, when he finished praying, he said, how do you feel? I said, I feel 80% better. It's just gone. And I turned my head and I coughed and it was fine. The pain has gone. 80% better. So he said, okay, if you need me to pray again, then um, come and find me. And so a couple of days later, I did go and find him and he prayed for me again. And um, oh, I'm 90% better now, Andrea. This is amazing. The pain has gone. And since then, the pain has continued to subside. And so, you know, I'm pretty much back to normal, um, if normal <laughs> is, is a word uh, in my vocabulary. <laughs> what was God showing me? God was showing me that a spirit of foreboding can destroy our faith. And that faith has to endure. That faith has to pers persist in terms of not being brief. I want to just show you. It was amazing. It was amazing. I knew God was going to do something. And that's why I didn't sort of want to share it too wide before it had happened. But I knew God was going to do something. And so let me just look at another scripture about Peter. This is Peter walking on the water in Matthew. When Peter uh, <clears throat> called to him, Lord, it's really you. Tell me to come and walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water to, towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and waves, he was terrified and he began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? It's that word oligos again. It's not little faith, it's brief faith. Peter, why did you have such brief faith? Why didn't you persist? Why did you take your eyes off me? This is the spirit of foreboding again. Why did you take your eyes off me and look at the wind and the waves? And then you thought, whoa, I'm going to sink. Help, I'm going to sink. And that spirit of foreboding had taken away your faith. If, Peter, you had kept your eyes on me, you'd have walked all the way. And so God showed me that this is incredible that, you know, when we are really hoping in God, we're believing in God, we're praying in God, we have to keep our eyes on him. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. We have to keep our eyes on him. And as soon as we take our eyes off him, as soon as we look at the circumstances, as soon as I started to think, well, maybe I've got this all wrong. Maybe I really am ill. Maybe I should have been sensible and gone to the doctor and not come to Guatemala and blah, blah, blah. No. Actually, in order to maintain our faith, in order to grow my faith, and in order to strengthen my faith, I have to keep my eyes on him. I think if Peter had the option to do that a second time, I think he'd have walked for miles. He'd have said, don't worry about the boat. I'll be over the other side before you. You know, we cannot grow our faith by sitting in the boat and hoping it'll grow. The only way to grow our faith is to get out of the boat and to walk on water and to begin to say to God, uh, you know, to keep our eyes on him. And so just for the sake of time, because I know 
time is running out this morning. I want to just um, just bring one more uh, script to, to you. How, how does faith come and how do we grow our faith? Well, we know faith comes by hearing. And we know that we grow our faith by the trials of our faith. But I also just want to bring in this one more scripture for us because I think God is taking us into a new season. And when I, and certainly I'm being taken into a new season, when I retired from full time work in 2019, I said to God, God, what's next? What's the next season? And God said to me, It's not the next season, it's a new season. And I said to God, what is the difference between a next season and a new season? And God said this in Isaiah, Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I will tell you. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise to the ends of the earth. I think God wants to bring the church into a new season. I think he wants to bring individuals into a new season. He's taking me into a new season. What's the difference between a next season and a new season. Well, Isaiah is saying that God is doing a new thing, not the next thing. Yes, are we equipped? Well, we are equipped for the season that we're in now, but that equipment, that equipping is not enough to take us into the new season because new season, it says, needs a new song. And the new song in scripture talks about a new way of thinking, a new mindset, a new way of thinking. And so, even though God is doing the next thing, the former things have something to do with the new season because God, I believe, over the last number of years, God has, since we've been doing all these series, God has been preparing us and developing us and showing us and teaching us. So all of that, of course, is valuable for the new season. But God says the new season needs a new song. And a new song in this context is referring to a new way of thinking. That word shear, uh, that word sing, a new song, is the Hebrew word shear. And it's like a, it means like a wandering minstrel. What does a wandering minstrel do? He goes around singing and declaring news and new things. Um, <clears throat> and so God wants us to sing a new song. A, a song of what? A song of praise. Okay, not a song of thanksgiving. Songs of thanksgiving are great. But songs of thanksgiving are saying, thank you, God, for what you've done for me. Not a song of worship. A song of worship is great, but it talks about adoring him. But a song of praise. What is a song of praise declaring? His character, his nature, who he is, what he will do, what he can do. There's no one like you. You are a mighty God. You are a great God. You are a powerful God. There is no one who can compare to you. And Isaiah is telling us that God wants a new season with a new song with a new way of thinking and a song of praise to the ends of the earth. Therefore, what does it mean, the ends of the earth? It's going to have global impact. God wants to reach to the ends of the earth. So I leave this with you this morning. What is God saying to you? What does God want to do? Where are you at in your faith? It's not about little faith. Where do you need to persevere? Where do you need to push on? Where do you need to underpin your faith with hope? Where do you need to get into his word? What is your relationship like with him? Does it hold strong in your faith in him? What does God want to say to you? God wants to reach the ends of the earth. And I think if we really want to exercise our faith, it's got to be rooted in our relationship with him. And if we want our faith to grow, we've got to get out of the boat. Don't just sit in the boat hoping that something's going to happen. That isn't going to happen. We've got to get out of the boat. And we've got to exercise faith. Amen. Great. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Sophie team, come join me. Um, some excellent encouragement there to persevere. Use the word persevere in faith. Why do we have weeks of prayer and fasting in our church? Why do we keep... Um, those intentions in our minds to keep ourselves on it and keep those disciplines in place. So let's stand. I feel like I want to pray. Deborah, I think I need to pray right now for everybody. I think you will have pricked in our minds some real senses of, hang on, I've given up too quick. I've given up. I've pulled back when I should be going ahead. And 
And maybe you have, and it's, you know, this is God's brilliant encouragement to us this morning. Come on, just keep pressing through. I know that when we've seen some of our most amazing miracles, it's been not the first time we prayed, or even the second time, it actually is the third time. You go back and you see, and I love the percentages, Deborah. You say, you know, I'm, you know, 80%, then 90%. Quite frankly, God wants you to be 100%, right? So maybe there's a perseverance there. So um, that's, that's the same challenge for us. I've seen that physically. When we went to Macedonia one year, and we prayed for a, a Muslim background guy who just came and asked us why on earth we were helping to paint a bridge led to a cup of coffee talked about trusting in God Almighty uh, came back the next day for prayer because he had no other he had no other options and I said well if you're serious about it we'll pray and three times we prayed for him and in the end we got him on video just saying how God has just amazingly healed him and we've, I've got that video still on my phone it's incredible. It's that persistence. Let's pray. Look, if, if in your life you're sensing that you've been challenged about perseverance in prayer, just open your hands in front of you because you know what it is that God's taking you on a journey in. And I'm going to pray right now that, that, that your courage, your confidence, your faith will extend and that it'll be, you'll be re-sparked to keep pressing on in those areas. Because if you're in your heart of hearts, you know that God's doing something. Just keep working that through. You may need to speak to one or two others, perhaps in your small group or your trusted uh, friend who's got faith who can just pray with you in these areas. That might be necessary. But Father God, I just thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord God, that you encourage us in your word to keep pressing in and to, and to just discover that there's more in our faith that you've given to us than we even realize. So Father God, I pray for each one of us, those in the room, those hearing my voice right now, Lord God, that the faith in their world will become stronger and more persistent, Lord God, so that we can see those situations which indeed, Lord, will be miracles, Lord, come to pass, Lord, in your time. And so, Lord God, we thank you that you put that that deposit in our hearts to be able to do something with it. And Lord, for those who aren't actually doing anything with their faith right now, I pray, Lord, you know, a polite kick, Lord, in the right place would just encourage us to start using that gift that you've given to us already. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So we sing a worthy 
started our service acknowledging that there's no one like our God. Lord, you're our source. Lord, it's you who inspires us. Lord, you're the one who builds faith. Lord, who gives us faith in the first place. Lord, help us to have confidence and courage to press through those circumstantial doubts where uncertainty comes in and to, to just take hold of those things that are in front of us, Lord, that by faith we can trust you in. I pray, Lord God, that you'd lift our levels of perseverance in faith in the church. Lord God, that as we move forward, God, we'll be able to give testimony to the amazing things that you've done. Thank you, Lord, you're doing so much already. And we thank you, Lord, that we're able to celebrate the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord, for people getting baptized, coming to faith, having lives changed. Lord, Lord, the multiplication of this church. Lord God, we thank you, the reminder that you measure things. Lord, and we're glad you do, Lord. You hold us to account for what is measured. Uh, but Lord God, you take responsibility as well for those things. And you fill our lives with your presence so that we can just see amazing things happen. So Lord God, strengthen those in the room. Strengthen those online, no matter where they are, around this country or abroad. Lord, where there has been frustration. We thank you, Lord God, that you lift us. Lord, you restore our soul. Lord, you bring us close to you and you show tender mercies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just want to say thank you for being with us today. Those of you online, those in the room. If you're new, say hi to me. Uh, speak to Deborah if you would like prayer. You can also, there's normally a prayer team which will tend to hover a bit down here. They'll be wearing lanyards. Guys, if you are a prayer team person, then do make sure you stand there. And if you'd like prayer, then feel free to come and speak to any one of us. Uh, otherwise, enjoy your day. Have a fantastic time with your family and with friends. Stick around for a cup of coffee. Don't forget your kids. Let's show our appreciation to all the teams and to Deborah. Thank you for being with us today. If you are new, uh, connect with us. We have connect cards in our lobby. We look forward to seeing you very soon. God bless. Thank you.